You know when we said our struggles are all connected? Listen to this. ...to all the other things in the dirt in the Congo, there's a lot of uranium there. And in fact, the uranium that was used in the bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki came from a mine not too far from Kolowezi, and it was bought by the Manhattan Project from the Belgians at that time and put in those two bombs. Uh, you can't say this anymore. Probably going to get cancelled for saying this. <laughs> you can't say this anymore. You can, you simply can't say this. I'm not allowed to talk anymore. I can't talk. I've been silenced. Clearly, I'm not allowed to say this anymore. I've been silenced. I can't talk anymore. I've been cancelled, guys. You can't hear me. I don't have a voice. A buddy of mine, no longer a buddy of mine, don't worry, don't worry, recently told me that he has changed his pronouns to they. I said, <clears throat> I said, how, um, how, many, how many people are you now? Uh, I'm a Christian. <laughs> you can't say that anymore. Come on then, woke agenda, come for me. I like God. I said it, <laughs> he went there. <laughs> they asked me if I wanted the vaccine to which I said, no thanks. The only protection I need is the rifle I keep under my bed for home intruders. That's right. I've shot people. Have you seen the Barbie movie? <laughs> I haven't, I haven't. Um, but I hear it's woke. Do you know what they say? Go woke, go broke. Am I right? <laughs> Girl power, more like, um, over a billion at the box office. Oh, shit. Uh, I'm not racist, but <laughs> I am. I am. I am. I am. Hey, boss man. I saw you pushing that little boy up against a locker, and I just love how you move. That's the best part, my guy. It's just like Call of Duty, except you have way more nightmares about it. Come on, big, strong guy like you? I can definitely see you leading an ambush on a water purification plant. I can bring my gun anywhere. As long as you lie to your parents about what we actually do, they're gonna be so proud. And once you're out of service, like, will you get health care? Sort of. Will you get mental health care? Definitely not. Will you get a Dodge Charger? Um, I'm still waiting on mine. Just a question because I think I'm trans and I don't know if I'm faking it or not. But do you have to have liked boy stuff as a child to be a trans man? Not at all. All kids like a variety of masculine and feminine things and this extends to trans people as well. And not all cis boys liked boys toys and likewise not all trans boys like boys toys. Gender is a confusing and complex topic for a lot of people so don't rush yourself into a label or into transitioning if you don't feel ready. If you think you're trans, the next best step in my experience is to roll that information out to trusted friends who will experiment with names and pronouns for you. You can also try out haircuts and clothing, but remember that all of this is about what feels most comfortable for you. You do not have to fit a cookie cutter stereotype of a trans man in order to be one. While I am on testosterone, dress masculine, and have top surgery, I don't want bottom surgery, but I'm still a trans man. Everyone has a different experience with their gender, and that's okay. Have a lovely day. Free Palestine! We did. It's Israel completely pulled out of the guy. And let me say this, this, this evil twink, this evil twink, you have earned yourself an op for life. If, if he has no haters, I have passed. You need to go, you need to come get me because I've been passed. Check up on me if this man has no haters because until the day that I die, everything that this man does is going to be slandered by me. To say that Zionism is sexy or to get stickers because he got stickers that said that, baby, it's not giving that. It never gave. It never really gave that. First and foremost of all, saying that Zionism is sexy when you look like uh, the tethered of a great value Ellen DeGeneres is wild to me. And all I know is I'm glad that Stranger Things is ending because you got some Stranger Things coming for you, baby, because your everything that you do will fail. I'm going to call that right now. I call failure onto your whole career in life because the way that this this twink has been going really hard against Palestinians, people who are on the receiving end of something so vicious and cruel, yeah, it's up and stuck for me. You too, Timothy Chalamet.
men's rights activist who became famous in some circles for his work around false accusations against men has been accused of, trigger warning, dismembering his partner. Before I tell you more about this story, which is admittedly disturbing and upsetting, let's talk briefly about false accusations. Depending on what study you look at, in most reliable studies, the rates of false accusations are somewhere between two and 10%. One often cited study showed that men are more likely to be raped than to be falsely accused of rape. But Joseph Carl Roberts essentially tried to build a career off of saying he had been falsely accused of sexual harassment. But it's a little more complicated than that. Roberts enrolled in college at Savannah State in Georgia in 2009. At the time, he was 28 years old. In 2011, he was reportedly spreading rumors on Twitter about an ex-girlfriend having venereal disease. In 2013, he said that three women had falsely accused him of sexual harassment. At that time, the school said they were kicking him out because of damage to property and disorderly conduct. In 2015, Roberts, on his own, without a lawyer, sued the university for discrimination on the basis of sex. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, one of the women who he named in the lawsuit told them that she didn't even know him, so she hadn't accused him of anything because she didn't know him. He then became known as an advocate for so-called due process, and then Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos referenced him and his story at a speech she gave at George Mason University in 2017. Roberts was even featured on Nightline and later penned an op-ed in USA Today. In 2018, he enrolled in law school just up the road from me in San Francisco with a scholarship. Soon after enrolling, he dropped out. He then returned in fall of 2019, which is when Rachel Elizabeth Imani Buckner, known as Imani, also enrolled in that same law school. Somewhere along the way, Imani and Robert started dating. In the spring of 2020, he runs for and wins a leadership role within a local Republican committee. Also in the spring of 2020, he gives an interview in which he, according to the San Francisco Chronicle, likens his conversation with Betsy DeVos to a conversation between Martin Luther King and Lyndon B. Johnson regarding civil rights. Imani, who had attended Howard University on a full scholarship, had also become a spoken word poet attending weekly events in Oakland. However, once the pandemic happened in the spring of 2020, a lot of her friends no longer heard from her and she was no longer doing spoken word poetry. It's unclear what was happening in her relationship with Roberts, but from January of 2022 to June of 2023, there were 17 calls to the police for welfare checks, disturbances, and domestic violence reports at their apartment. Apparently in June of 2023, she said something to a friend about how she was worried that he was going to kill her. On July 20th, someone walking on a trail found a garbage bag that smelled like they said fish, and they called the police. When the police came and investigated, they found parts of a woman's body in the bag. And when they tested the duct tape that had been put around the bag, they found two people's DNA. One was that of Imani, and the other belonged to Roberts. If you find yourself more concerned about false accusations than you are about the very real harms that are done to women, and especially women of color, including black women in this country every single day, I am telling you, you are misguided. And if you come into my comments talking about that, I will delete and block because I've had enough. I wanna leave you with a poem recited by Ali Jones at a vigil held for Imani. I dare you to hold space for black girls who bloom in a drought Black girls who ask too many questions and don't learn from our mistakes, from the sweetest sunflower to the thorniest rose, I dare you to embrace black girls. I've seen many people respond to this video talk about it in terms of punishment, that he is punishing his wife, that is absolutely correct. I want to take it in a slightly different direction though, because it's also hypocritical. How many times have we heard men on this app complain that women won't tell them what they need, what they want, their words, their actions. It's always mystifying because they can't come right out and say it. She can't tell you what she wants to do. She can't tell you what she wants to eat. But this is so much worse than any of that because the stakes are so much higher. And I am certain that he said that it was fine. Maybe he even encouraged her to go away. He certainly 
did not express just how opposed he was. I can't imagine she would have done it at all if she knew it would enrage him this much. This isn't even passive aggressive, this is aggressive aggressive. I want to drink that cream. Self-driving cars are terrifying, and you should probably avoid them if you see them driving down the street. The first time I saw one of these out in the wild, I thought to myself, I thought, wow, this technology seems way too fresh to be out in the world right now. And I was kind of right to assume that, because I found out that people who live in cities where these cars operate hate these cars, because they almost hit people and drive into crime scenes, construction sites, and firefighting operations. Not only that, but the self-driving car company Cruise has apparently known that their cars have a hard time recognizing children. As in, these cars do not exercise extra caution when children are present, making them a danger to child pedestrians. And this information comes from their own internal assessments, by the way. Right now, the self-driving car industry wants to go from hundreds of self-driving cars on city streets to thousands. And as of right now, I personally think that's a horrible idea. And you know, God forbid society investing in plentiful, safe, and functional public transportation. Let's just pump out robot cars that put children in danger. I want to eat that. Beyonce still hasn't said anything in support of Palestine, Congo, Sudan, Haiti, nothing about anything really so far. Uh, and one of my mutuals just posted a video talking about how if she doesn't say anything soon, then they are not going to watch her new movie. Just listen to me for a second before you come for me because I know I'm not supposed to do this. I know I'm not supposed to say anything remotely negative about Beyonce on Beyonce's internet. Trust me, I saw Swarm. Okay, but this question is very valid. And if you are a Beyonce fan, if you are a fan of any celebrity or artist who has not said anything as of yet, just at least hear what I have to say. How far does your allyship, your advocacy, your support really go? Because so many of y'all have been passionate and outspoken about these Starbucks boycotts or these McDonald's boycotts, but would you ever boycott Beyonce? Like, let's actually think about it for a second. If she were to come out in support of Israel, for example, I'm not saying that this happened, but if she were, how would you feel about that? If she were to remain silent, remain neutral in this situation as we know taking the side of the oppressor how would you feel about that because again a lot of y'all have been very vocal about your disappointment in influencers on tiktok for example beauty influencers who have remained silent on this issue or influencers who don't typically post political commentary you're disappointed in them and you're calling them out for remaining silent because you know that silence is complicity but when it comes to your favorite artists and celebrities who have massive internationally recognized platforms they get a pass why? I think in situations like these, people tend to infantilize almost these celebrities, these billionaires saying, oh, well, if, you know, the music industry is just, it's so tough. She probably has contracts that she can't breach with different organizations and corporations that, you know, may be actively funding these genocides and, you know, support Israel and whatever. But like, that's, that's not her, like she's, she's, her hands are tied. Forgetting that she's a fucking billionaire. She's literally Beyonce. She can do what she wants she's a grown woman she can do whatever she wants you know what i'm saying to prove that and to showcase that let's look at what beyonce has posted on her instagram in the last month versus kehlani five days ago she posted a video promoting her new movie this is october 26th another one about her new movie the day before that a video promoting her new perfume and the day before that promoting her new perfume and you know what maybe i'll eat my words maybe she'll come out with this like massive support campaign for palestine and for congo and sudan or something something maybe that's why she hasn't said anything for so long but if she doesn't how long does she get how much grace does she get because like i said y'all have been on it coming for these other influencers who haven't said anything as of yet it's been about a month and for a lot of y'all that was your limit like it's been a month it, you've taken too long so how long does beyonce get how long do these other artists and celebrities get how much longer are you willing to give them before you stop buying their products, stop listening to their music, stop watching their movies, how long? Now let's look at Kehlani's Instagram starting from the beginning of October to now. This is what it looks like consistently across the board. And if you follow Kehlani, they're posting in their story daily. They posted conversations on their live streams, amplifying Palestinian voices actively, directly. I'm not saying that every single person's Instagram page needs to look like Kehlani's. I'm also not saying that this is just about Beyonce. I just wanted to take a moment to talk about artists because so many people have this tendency of separating the art from the artist. We saw time and time again y'all could list multiple examples in the comments of how many times people have said well i'm separating the art from the artist at what point does that stop though and again i'm using beyonce fans as an example because it is a lot more difficult to separate the art from the artist when those two things have consistently been intertwined a lot of people when it comes to beyonce she has changed their entire lives 
through her music and not even just her music through like who they feel she is as a person and it is going to be near impossible for you to make that separation between her as a person and her personal decisions her business decisions her moral decisions versus her art what are you going to do with this information Really, let's think about it. We could fill this comment section with all the different celebrities who have not said a peep about what is going on right now. But y'all are very comfortable calling out influencers who have a couple hundred thousand followers or a couple million followers who haven't said anything. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. Yes, absolutely we should. People should be using their voices. But if you're gonna come for an influencer who has 500,000 followers, but you're not gonna say anything about your favorite artist who has hundreds of millions of followers, you need to reflect on why that is. There's this thing that I've experienced quite frequently where heterosexual men assume that I'm interested in them. And I think they might assume that I'm interested in them because their understanding of transgender women is that we're just out there begging for straight dick. Most of the men who express romantic or sexual attraction to me identify as heterosexual. My primary partner identifies as heterosexual and I've had my most long-term relationships with men who identify as heterosexual. And not to overshare or anything, but I've had a lot of sex, okay? I've had a lot of sex in my life and I honestly do not want to ever be with another man who's not 100% about his attraction to me. Because I socialize a lot and I go to a lot of sex positive kind of events, I'm in a lot of situations where men have this kind of hesitation when it comes to pursuing me. And I find that hesitation to be understandable but very unattractive to me. So I'm definitely not going to be interested in someone who's not attracted to me because I'm transgender no matter how hot they are. So Israel's official Twitter page posted this, the first ever pride flag raised in Gaza, stating that this dude right here is a member of the LGBTQ community and wanted to send a message of hope to the people of Gaza living under Hamas's brutality. His intention was to raise the first pride flag in Gaza as a call for peace and freedom. This is what they posted. This dude held up a flag saying, in the name of love, and look at where he's standing. Look at his surroundings. He is literally standing in the middle of a demolished city center, or at least a demolished place where people used to live normal lives. It got turned into complete rubble. But hey guys, we got the pride flag and it's in the name of love. And there's literally a fucking tank right here. What about any of this screams love to you? What about any of this screams peace and freedom to you? Do you know how many children, how many innocent people probably died in this very area where he's holding up this flag? Not to mention that there's more than likely been gay Palestinians killed by Israeli bombings. Israel are quite literally doing this meme. They are the most cartoonishly evil country in the world right now. Almost all your taxes go to military installations on foreign bases, 800 of them, but no other country has a military base in America, cause it's a fear tactic, it's a fear tactic, we are a fascist police state, fascist police state. Why is nobody talking about how upper class frat boys sound exactly like valley girls? You know what I'm talking about, the frat boy accent. Saw, so, dude, we totally got wasted at that function last night. And then there's the valley girl accent. Oh my god, we totally got wasted at that pool party last night. They both speak in a glottal fry with the same kind of breathy articulation. They both have an airy rhythm and use words like like a lot. And noticeably, they both upspeak at the end of their sentences, which linguists call high rising terminal or HRT. And I've looked, there's very little research into the origins of bro culture, but it does seem to have some roots in surfer culture, which might be that California connection to the valley girl accent. But the most interesting part about this to me, the reason frat boys from Pennsylvania to Arizona all speak the same way is because it serves to create a social in-group. Speaking like a frat bro is kind of a class indicator called a sociolect, which tells our monkey brains, oh, you're part of this tribe of people. When a frat bro is speaking to another frat bro, that is social signaling that yes, I am one of you. This is particularly important in community-based groups like fraternities. And exactly the same thing happened with the Valley Girl accent. It came out of cliques, friend groups in Southern California where all the girls are the same social class and they're just trying to communicate to each other. Oh my God, we're literally like the same right now now. Yeah, probably, but hey, why isn't gay marriage legal in Israel? Why are there restrictions for donating blood if you're in the LGBT community? Why is it non-binary recognized? I, I don't know, just some things I've been thinking. Every day I'm fascinated by the fact that my realization that I'm autistic coincided with the realization that I'm gender fluid. I don't know exactly what I'm getting at here, but there must be a strong correlation between autistic people and gender fluidity in any sense 
versus the holistic world. There has to be. I think Emily had a post about this where she made it analogous to a particle versus a wave where you feel like a wave internally, but then when you are perceived in a moment in time, you turn into a very specific particle that's like, oh boy, oh girl, oh androgynous, oh somewhere along the spectrum. And that's very true for me because as I've embraced my autistic spectrum, I've also started to embrace my gender spectrum. Like, I never feel like a man. At most, I feel like a boy, but never a man. And I'm really attracted to, both in my personal sense of self and sense of style, and in other people, more femme traits. And again, I don't really know what I'm getting at here, but all of these realizations also coincided with me unmasking and me realizing that I am autistic. And so it's almost like, I don't know, each informs the other in a way. It's just a, a beautiful journey of self-flourishing that I'm on right now, I don't know. Did you know that Stranger Things was based on real CIA experiments? While the series is grounded in the supernatural, it also draws inspiration from a real human experiment government program called MKUltra. This program began in 1953 and was halted in 1973, and it used U.S. citizens as unwitting test subjects in order to experiment with drugs and procedures that could be used during interrogations for mind control. And they actually explicitly referenced the program in the first season of Stranger Things. They revealed that Eleven's mother volunteered to participate in MK Ultra, and she was subjected to psychedelic drugs and sensory deprivation, similar to the real life members of the program. She was a part of some study in college. MK Ultra. Yeah, that's the one. It was uh, started in the 50s. By the time Terry got involved, it was supposed to be ramping down, but the drugs just got crazier. Messed her up good. This was the CIA that ran this? They'd pay you know, a couple hundred bucks to people like my sister, give them drugs, psychedelics. LSD mostly, and then they'd strip her naked and put her in these isolation tanks. They wanted to expand the boundaries of the mind. Let's get into exactly why this program existed. During the early period of the Cold War in the 1950s, the American public was both terrified and fascinated by the fear of brainwashing and of a new breed of brain warfare. The CIA grew concerned that the Soviet Union and other communist countries had discovered a drug or technique that would allow them to control human minds. And they feared that during World War II, they used these techniques on American prisoners of war. In response, the CIA started a top secret program called MK Ultra, with the goal to find a mind control drug that could be weaponized against enemies. The ultimate result was illegal drug testing and the torture of thousands of Americans. MK Ultra wasn't just one project, it was 162 different secret projects indirectly financed by the CIA that were contracted out to various universities, research foundations, and similar institutions. Many of these experiments were carried out without the full knowledge or consent of the human subjects involved. And also in a lot of these cases, academic research researchers being funded through grants from CIA front organizations were unaware that their work was being used for these purposes. These trials used many different methods, such as hypnosis, sensory deprivation, electroshock treatment, isolation, and many different types of physical and verbal abuse. But at the core of the program was the study of the drug LSD. Especially in the beginning of the program, CIA scientists became obsessed with LSD in their search for mind-controlling drugs. In the early 1950s, the MK Ultra director Sidney Gott Gottlieb arranged for the CIA to pay $240,000 to buy the world's entire supply of LSD. He then began spreading it around to hospitals, clinics, prisons, and other institutions. The CIA asked these institutions to carry out research projects and find out what LSD was and how people reacted to it. Some participants did freely volunteer, but more often volunteers were coerced or were misled about the reality of the program. They frequently preyed on vulnerable people for these studies, such as mental patients, prisoners, drug addicts, and prostitutes, or in the words of one CIA officer, people who couldn't fight back. The CIA conducted MKUltra in top secrecy. They were concerned about national security and wanted to keep this information away from enemies, but they also needed to keep it a secret from the American general public, since, you know, this program was obviously extremely unethical and often illegal. There's some gray area around when these experiments ended or if they actually ended at all. But we'll get back to that in a second. When a member of the CIA Inspector General's staff learned about these projects, he insisted the agency follow new research ethics guidelines and end all non-consensual programs. This happened in 1963. Did that happen? We don't know. 
there's actually a lot of information that the general public does not know about MK Ultra, and that's because in 1973 most records of the program were purposely destroyed by the CIA. Makes you wonder what else they're doing without us knowing. Anyway, moving on. But thousands of pages of files ended up getting misplaced in the budget and fiscal records. These were found in 1977, which launched another round of inquiries into the MK Ultra project. In 1977, the government conducted congressional hearings investigating the effects of MK Ultra. CIA employees were questioned about the program, but Congress kept hitting roadblocks. Staffers claimed they couldn't remember details of many of the projects, or even the number of people involved. And since most of the records were destroyed, a lot of people involved got off penalty free, despite destroying the lives of thousands of Americans. There's a really great podcast called This Is Actually Happening, and they have an episode where a woman talks about how her mother was a victim of MK Ultra. It's really heartbreaking, but it's a really good episode, and it's great if you're trying to learn more about MK Ultra and just the devastating effects of this program, and also to their family members and other loved ones. The CIA itself has acknowledged that these experiments made very little scientific sense, and that the agents doing the experiments were not qualified scientific observers. Unfortunately, there isn't a way to know how long exactly the MK Ultra experiments actually went on. 14-year CIA veteran Victor Marchetti had stated in multiple interviews that the CIA routinely conducted disinformation campaigns and the mind control research continued. And he said in a 1977 interview that the CIA claim that the MK Ultra project was abandoned was simply a cover story. What kind of jam is that? Increased productivity is not the answer to income inequality. A wealthy person will look you dead in your eyes after you gave them hard data on inflation and stagnant wages, proving that this is a systemic issue and tell you that the reason why your life sucks is because you're lazy. Yeah, it's definitely because I'm lazy and not because I work full time and can barely keep $3,000 in my savings. Productivity culture is a cult and the ultra wealthy people are the preachers who benefit the most. Have you ever heard of the productivity pay gap? Within less than half a century, worker productivity has increased by about 65% and hourly wages have seen a 17.3% increase. You don't need to be a math whiz to understand that you are being taken advantage of. Burnout murders us from the inside. It makes it harder to organize activism and social movements to better our lives because we are all exhausted. So I'm sorry if I roll my eyes at a suggestion from some tech bro with generational wealth who says that I just need to find a side hustle and go to the gym for my depression and economic status to magically improve. I want to eat that. Something I find so fascinating is we keep each other safe, like collective safety is a thing, right? So the more people that post about Palestine, the more safe it becomes to post about Palestine because the less they can single us out. But some people have such an individualistic understanding of safety that they're like, oh, I'm just going to protect myself. They're not like, oh, I'm going to protect the collective by actually adding to the voices of the collective so the collective cannot be divided and concurred. You know what I mean? So as long as we're more difficult to single out, they cannot attack us. So when you worry about your safety, maybe you are playing into the hands of the individualist paradigm that they want you to play into. But just know safety was never something that you were meant to give yourself. It was something that we as a collective women to give to each other. Some people sleep while others stay awake. We have always as a species protected each other. It is our survival and it is no different. Okay, over here. Love you, bye. Jimmy S, I've got fucking clinical depression, you fucking idiot. Kids, where's the monument to my godliness? You know I went to work today, right? Like every other day? I'm sorry, why'd you say you don't respect me? Oh, cause I constantly berate you and I hate you and I resent you. Wow. Hey, you realize I followed the law raising you, right? I could have broken it, but I didn't. Clearly, you've never read A Child Called It because I almost treated you like that kid. I just decided not to. I'm sorry, um... You think it's okay to disrespect me to your little friends because I'm a bigot? Wow. Why don't any of your friends like me? Just because I say slurs? That's stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, sorry, I didn't notice you during my candid photo shoot. Today we're here in 19th century Georgia, and we're helping out our fellow settlers and homesteaders who need to till the land because there's no one here. Yeah, it's a beautiful scene of love, of people helping each other. Who are these people behind me? Uh, don't worry about them. Yeah, maybe they lived here first, but they didn't deserve the land. They weren't using it properly. You know, God told us through Manifest Destiny that we were meant to take the land, that we were deserving of it, that the people who had it before, that they were backwards evil savages. Across all of its expressions, from the Native Americans to the Aboriginals in Australia, settler colonialism is a disgusting ideology that has led to the deaths of millions of people and the destruction of so much culture. To glorify it in the way that this is done in the original video is completely ridiculous, but it's the standard practice of settlers. They love to romanticize what they're doing, to pretend that they are so connected to the land that they really care about it and that they are the ones who deserve it. When in reality, they are nothing more than people who have taken something from another people through the use of violence. Do you guys ever think about Monsters, Inc. and how these like relatively normal people clocked in, clocked out every single day when their entire career was terror? Their whole job, the, entire, the, the only job, was to terrify children, scare children. They literally captured the screams of children in these little canisters and then counted them up to compete for the highest scare total. And you look at these funny guys and you go like, they don't look evil. They look like nice, sort of funny, goofy guys. So what could compel them to terrorize children for a living? Particularly when it's this blatant, children scared, <laughs> scared totals. And they put the screams in the little canisters. Like there is no ambiguity about it, right? And there's no ambiguity about whether or not this would be considered terror in, real, in the real world. So how do they get these guys to do this? Pure, unholy terror. Look at his eyes. He's like 10 times her size. Up on the bench, pressed up against the wall, terrified. Of, of who? Oh, her. Her, little baby boo. So how do we teach this big, strong guy to be this scared of this little girl? Well, this is really helpful. The CDA, Child Detection Agency, who are here for your safety. Sorry, sir, you have a tiny baby's sock on your back. It's an emergency because of a baby sock. He feels scared for his own safety and for the safety of his community. If this is the response to a baby sock, are you going to believe that that baby sock is life-threatening to you? Extremely dangerous? Yes! This is treated like an emergency. They had to blow it up. They had to blow it up for safety, to protect their people, right? And this poor guy. <laughs> so they put on displays like that for their community to reinforce and remind the idea, remind you of the fear, the ever present threat to your safety, to your children's safety. And they have to instill this level of fear in their citizens to ensure that they go nowhere near the children. You do not go near the children unless you are literally doing your job of scaring them, right? Because if you get too close, it all starts to unravel. The propaganda starts to unravel. The child is not a threat. The child is not dangerous. The child is a child. The child is no threat to your personal safety. The child is no threat to your community's safety. You are only taught to see the child as a threat because these numbers are money. The powers that be get people like this to scare babies like this by making them this scared using some of these tools in order to keep these numbers high to make money for these people. And the girls who get it, get it. Anyway, free Palestine.
corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. They're the same picture. I couldn't find a picture with the same view as the March for Israel one, but for comparison's sake, here are some of the pictures from the pro-Palestine March on Washington that unofficial reports say had upwards of like 100,000 people. Yeah, when you can be compared to Trump, you're probably in the wrong. It's so hard being a service worker sometimes. I'm working like 40 plus hours a week and I can't even afford to pay my rent. Instead of complaining, you could just go get a better job, man. <laughs> I have a master's degree. I'm $50,000 in debt, work full time, and I still cannot afford to pay my rent. This is why y'all need to stop going to fucking college. You should just go into, oh, please don't, don't say it. The trades. God, all I fucking want is a chicken chalupa. Hello there. Hello! Oh, hi, sorry, sir. We're actually closed. Like, forever. What?! <sighs> yeah, sir, all our employees left to get better jobs. So, we don't have anyone working here. Huh, of course. No one wants to fucking work these days. Um, excuse me, I broke my fucking arm. I need to see a nurse, like, immediately. Okay, I'm sorry to hear that, sir. Um, we are super low-staffed on nurses, so it's gonna be about a 23-hour wait. But you can just wait over there and we'll call you when they're ready, okay? What? 23 hours?! My fucking arm is, like flailing all around. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but we just aren't getting any new applications for nurses. People just don't really want to go to college anymore. It's just too expensive. So you just sit over there, okay? Well, you gotta have like somebody here who can fucking help me, right? Somebody's gotta be able to help me. Okay, sir, just calm down. Let me look and see what we can do for you. Okay, um, we do have an electrician who works here. Maybe he could take a look at your arm. No, okay. Um, a carpenter. We have a carpenter who works here. A couple, actually. They do know how to, like, fix things, so they might be able to, you know, fix your arm. No? Okay. A plumber. We do have a plumber on site. Would you like him to look at your arm? No? Okay, well then, the chair right over there. It's all yours. 23 hours. See you in a bit, okay? Do I hate men? No. That's a lie. <sighs> Find your dreams come true And I wonder if you know what it means Capitalism has ruined the concept of an ugly Christmas sweater because it used to be that when you had an ugly Christmas sweater party or contest coming up, you would go to your mom or grandma's closet or the thrift store and pull out the ugliest sweater that you can find that someone once purchased because they thought it looked good. But now they purposely manufacture the sweaters to be ugly Christmas sweaters. And they even sell kits with like garland and a bunch of little attachments that you can use to make your own ugly Christmas sweater if you don't wanna go through the effort of finding one. And I feel like that just defeats the whole purpose of an ugly Christmas sweater. Transgender Week of Visibility is the most cisgender holiday I have ever seen. Today is all about cis people remembering we exist and teaching them empathy. If you look at all the content, even when it's made by trans people, it's all how to be a better ally, how to empathize, how to respect, how to use pronouns 101. And then on the other side, it's cis people telling other cis people, hey man, we gotta do better, man. We gotta do better for the trans people. And like, great but how long are we gonna be stuck on pronouns 101 it's feeling real elementary it's feeling real let's clap and give ourselves a pat on the back because you know we're being such great allies but there's so much more work to do but we should be so proud of ourselves because because we're, we're giving disability we're giving disability to this group i'm tired i'm bored i didn't even know it was trans week of visibility i only know because i got a job and we know the dates of different things every week is trans visibility week i'm looking at myself right now i'm visible i'm seeing it i see you too do you, do you feel seen You have a gap. I was taking care of my sick parents. I had sick parents. We had to hire a full-time caregiver. It's a full-time job. It takes a capable person to handle someone's health. Yeah, I'm very capable. Oh, no. I mean, we're going to go a different direction. You have a gap. What? 
I stay home with the kids now. What about your career? I've always been kind of more family oriented and this worked out for us. So you don't work. <laughs> Trust me, it's a full-time job, but it's different. Why? You'd be bored. We just end up talking about our jobs. So? Hmm, Cause you're homeschooling the kids now. Soren works for a daycare. That's administrative. Layla's a speech therapist. She's a professional. Yuki's a teacher. Where she teaches. It's different. Why? I've got so much respect for unpaid caregivers. W wait, what? You're a caregiver, just like us. Hospice, respite, social worker and many other aspects of caregiving. But those are careers. Why does that make you any less valuable? I don't know, maybe the economy or something? It's different though, right? Paid, unpaid, it doesn't matter. Not only does caregiving make the world a better place, we make the world possible. Thank you. Tesla pissed off Swedish workers. You're not supposed to do that. Tesla workers in Sweden are demanding for Tesla to accept a proposal for collective bargaining and have a contract with the union. Tesla, headed by Elon Musk, is famously anti-union. Musk actually went as far as to once get in trouble for posting on Twitter a threat to his own employees when his employees were considering unionizing. He was found guilty of union busting there, and then he appealed the decision and it was upheld. But now in Sweden, over a hundred metal workers have walked off the job at places that service Tesla vehicles. And in a show of solidarity, other unions are jumping in. Dock workers are refusing to deliver Teslas. There are painters unions that are refusing to paint Teslas. Basically, anybody who can is lending their solidarity. Additional unions are threatening to join in over the coming weeks if Tesla continues to not listen to the collective bargaining. They will essentially continue to pile on until Tesla does the thing that virtually all employers in that region already do. They have been referred to by trade organizations as not a serious employer. If you're an American watching this, by the way, Listen to the words that I have said here. <laughs> it is standard procedure to have a trade union that fights for your working conditions in other countries. Standard, but I digress into the end of that segment. This is part two of our analysis of some of the brightest minds on TikTok regarding the Israel-Hamas conflict. Today, about 70% of all Gazans are considered refugees from the 1948 expulsion. Hey, pause that for a second. How is that even possible? Seriously, how is that even possible? When you say 70% of all Gazans are considered refugees from the 1948 expulsion, the only way to say that that is the case is by including, of course, all of the descendants. Yes, that's right. 70% of Gaza's population are considered refugees or the descendants of refugees from the original Nakba expulsion of 1948. 750,000 Palestinians were expelled from their homes in the 1948 Nakba. More Palestinians were expelled from their own homes in 1948 than the total number of Zionist settlers in all of Palestine, which numbered 600,000. Keep in mind, Palestinian Arabs numbered one point three million at the time they were the indigenous majority who were quote unquote expelled and by expelled we mean they moved three miles down the road from Ashkelon to the Gaza Strip Ben's counter argument to the harsh reality that Israel is a violent settler colony is to say that, well, they only expelled the Palestinians three miles down the road. It's kind of like saying, well, the Warsaw Ghetto was still in Warsaw. It's not like the Jews had to leave the city. Or the Bantu stands in South Africa were only a couple miles from the actual white cities. Polish Jews only had to move down the road to Auschwitz. It was not that far. So what if the Native Americans had to move to Oklahoma? It was just a few states away. Yeah, they moved three miles down the road into Gaza, where their life expectancy is a decade short than people living in Israel. So what, Israel is supposed to accept back entire populations of people who seek their destruction? What, us Zionists are supposed to live peacefully alongside people that we expelled and ethnically cleansed from their own land? Are you telling us Zionists that we're not supposed to bomb their hospitals and kill their children? Notice how he subtly sidesteps the entire anti-Zionist argument by rendering this straw man, reframing the narrative to be about how it's evil, bloodthirsty Palestinian Arabs who are hell-bent on Israel's destruction. This guy is deeply, painfully unserious. This predictably sparked a war, yes, when you have colonial powers coming into a territory that does not belong to them and forcibly removing people from their land, it tends to get violent. That's the end argument. The end argument, as always, that Israel is a colonialist occupying power, an outpost of the West. Yeah, that's where the argument ultimately ends because that is when the violent occupation started. Imagine that. Yes, Ben, these people were reconcentrated, pushed, 
herded into a strip of land that was unilaterally controlled by a militant ethnostate which imposed harsh repressive socioeconomic conditions upon those people in which British Prime Minister David Cameron, who was a conservative, labeled Gaza as an open-air prison. And all it comes down to is this idea that the Jews are the colonialist occupiers. That, that's, that's all it comes down to, which of course is the fundamental big lie at the root of all of this. Yeah, but you're missing context. What about before Christ? Invoking the Bible as an excuse to ethnically cleanse a population from its territory is a baby-brained middle school argument. Hold on a second. That's not the claim. That, that's always in the claim. The claim is not that the Bible justifies Jewish ownership of the Jewish homeland. No, that is the argument. That is the argument that you are trying to make. In fact, you've spent videos trying to justify Israel's stance here by citing biblical history by going back thousands of years. That's not the claim. The claim is that you are saying that original presence on the land is the historic justification for continued presence on the land. Once again, I will remind you what we as sane, rational, critical thinkers are saying is that biblical times and biblical rights have no status in the world today. No one can make the claim that 2,000 years ago, this is my version of history, and so this is why I have the right to ethnically cleanse these people. And so I'm saying the Jews predated the Palestinians, which is true by every possible measure. That has nothing to do with the Bible. That has to do with a basic historical argument. This is absolutely hilarious to me because the only person here in this dialogue that is trying to make an historic claim to legitimize ownership of a territory is Ben Shapiro. The only people that make these historic claims by invoking biblical times are the Zionists because they know they don't have a leg to stand on. Israel's occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank are universally decried by the international community as a violation of international law. Nobody can legitimize legitimately go back 3,000 years ago as justification for violent annexation of territory, Ben legitimately thinks that his favorite team should be above international law. You can go back to 2,000 years ago, you can go back to 3,000 years ago, you can go to 1300 BC, you can go to 1300. It doesn't mean shit. You can cope and you can cry and you can seethe all you want. These are the international laws, standards, practices, and principles that all countries, in theory, must abide by. Are you, are you coming to the tree? They strung up a man, they say you am not afraid. Strange things that happen to you, strange and wouldn't be. We left and lived right in the hanging tree. I've been feeling really shitty lately, so let's do some affirmations together. I am loved, I am fucking beautiful, I am so fucking smart, I am so talented, I deserve kindness and love and appreciation, my tits look fantastic today, I am not all the negative thoughts in my silly little head. Content warning for this next segment, I will be discussing the ongoing situation in Gaza. I will not be graphic. Israel is continuing their outsized retaliation on Gaza as the civilian death toll in Gaza has risen past 11,000. There's 11,000 lives that have been snuffed out, about half of whom were children. Recently, Israeli forces stormed one of the last operating hospitals in the evacuated region, where doctors, nurses, and other caretakers were taking care of active patients, including newborns. These hospital staff members chose to stay behind despite evacuation orders to take care of people who couldn't otherwise evacuate. I have read reports of doctors in the hospitals attempting to help patients during active shelling. Israel maintains that Hamas is secretly operating underneath the hospital, and so they need to continue to attack it. They have not provided any proof for that, and that is a claim that they have made many, many times in the past, not just in this conflict. Now, I am not in the business of trusting what Hamas has to say, and their response to Israel claiming that they are there is, nah, -uh. but I do not care. My tax money is going towards military support for this operation against my will. Shouting Hamas while pointing at something does not make me want to give you the thumbs up to bomb hospitals, where there's babies and sick people trying to live in the region that was told to be evacuated because bombs are happening. The world would be a better place if more people shared the heart of those caretakers. You know what's funny about being indigenous is people always ask you these weird ass questions like, oh my gosh, can I have some indigenous wisdom? And you know what? 
I don't always have to fucking act sacred and provide them with that wisdom. I don't have that 24-7 wisdom. They also ask me about the damn weather. I don't know what the fucking weather. You know what? I'm not a fucking weather app. I'm not a fucking weather man. Like, holy fuck, I'm just indigenous. But sometimes I go along with it and be like, Yes, I am indigenous. And the weather tomorrow is a chance of rain with a chance. Oh, fuck around and find out. You know what? I don't always have to fucking act sacred all the time. I'm fucking resi too. Like, holy fuck, you know what the wisdom that I'm going to provide you with that damn res dog down the road? He's going to fucking tear you up if you go over there. He's going to You're going to fuck around and find out. Like, holy fuck. Settle down. Defend indigenous land forever. This is a call to action. Right now, Brazil's indigenous communities face a dire threat to their rights, livelihoods, and homes. The Brazilian Senate's current trajectory prioritizes the construction of power plants, military bases, and highways, even at the alarming cost of indigenous sovereignty and irreversible damage to the Amazon rainforest. Following Brazil President Lula, partial veto of Bill PL2903, which would nearly displace 2 million indigenous peoples and open up the Amazon to corporate interest. Brazil's National Congress has until next Thursday, November 9th, to either sustain or override his veto. If the vetoes are maintained, the law will be approved, removing the parts mentioned in the veto. If the vetoes are overturned, the previously vetoed sections will be disregarded and the law will be approved with all the threats to indigenous peoples. In other words, the National Congress can approve the law disregarding all the vetoes made by Lula. We can't stop mobilizing on behalf of indigenous movement in villages, cities, networks to prevent this project from being transformed into the law of indigenous genocide. The fight continues. Did you know that one out of every 10 homeless people is likely to be a veteran? Hi, when I'm Aviola Goro, and this is DSR in a minute or less. So you've heard a lot about Veterans Day in the last week or so, and something that has been left out severely of the conversation is exactly not only, don't jump, don't jump, don't jump. If you just want to get back down, there you go. Um, is not only just kind of, you know, a mental health aspect, but a literal spending aspect. So often the United States is thought of as being the most pro-military, pro-veteran nation, but in fact, our actual spending does not back that. The United States government spending is, spending budget is six point three trillion dollars and about a sixth of that goes to the department of defense so out of that i think it's 1.8 trillion dollars but out of that 1.8 trillion only a quarter of that goes to veterans and general military personnel and even a smaller amount of that actually goes to pay for benefits once they are released from the military now some of this has been long debated and kind of skewed but in the last couple of years there has even been an increase from what the spending was before as i said previously one out of every 10 homeless people in america is a united states veteran and all veterans are at a significantly increased risk, risk 50% more than any other population to end up homeless. Furthermore from that, at least 10% of all U.S. veterans will experience severe PTSD. And out of that, we don't even know how much more it is because of the fact that PTSD and other forms of mental illness, especially amongst a more um, patriarchal system of See, he's coming back and asking to be held again. Jesus. Um, <laughs> out of a more patriarchal, whatever you want to call it, um, military industrial system, um, we don't even talk about those things. So we don't even know what the real numbers are because those numbers are already going to be from the people who actually talk about it or are willing to get the help. He's just like his brother. Help for it. Anyways, that's all for now. We'll continue to talk. <laughs> more later. I'm Abby Girl, and this has been DSR in a minute or less. Come back for more puppies. Bye! Kiss camera, kiss camera. I've reached the point where I'm just gonna allow myself to go insane. You're gonna go mad without losing your mind by Lamar Jarrell. Mandatory reading. You see this book, she cute and she thick. Love that for her and however. I'd like to remind us of two things. One, many of us have not read a book in several years. I'm not saying that to shame you. I'm saying it because it's true. So please read the essay, which brings me to point two. At points in time that were crucial to revolutions, there were pamphlets circulating and that's for a reason. A populace that does not read 
is a very easy populace to control. I would like to remind us that black people in this country were not allowed to read for a reason. All right, actually, let's dip into chapter one. We're talking about rejecting reason. I'm not talking about little r reason, which is just generic processes of cognition. We're talking about capital R reason. Reason, capital R is a hierarchical hegemony. White people decided what is reasonable and what is crazy for their own benefit. So let me tell you, if I learned anything from very expensive therapy school, it's that. Here's some point from chapter one, Drapetto Maniacal Slaves or Mad Black Movement. Remember when Samuel Cartwright, a Confederate doctor, coined the term drapetomania, meaning a um, kind of insanity that inflicted enslaved folks for wanting their freedom? Not only did Cartwright claim that black people were unconstitutionally fit, he claimed that they were mentally and physically healthier when they were enslaved and named ground zero for this disease to be Haiti. Haiti, which is currently seeing another seas of U.S. occupation. There is not a day that goes by where the white world does not punish Haiti for existing as a free state. The chapter of this book highlights madness as a methodology and there's a particular thesis I want to point out. Psychiatry is susceptible to ideology. All of the sci sciences is in what makes you crazy versus what makes you a sane person is susceptible to our biases as human beings that are living in a world that was created by white genocidal maniacs. All that is to say that if you feel crazy, good. Insanity is a prerequisite for revolution. Being pushed to a position where you are willing to rebel and burn down everything that you've ever known requires you to reject what is reasonable or normal or sane in the first place. If you think you learned a lot from this video, I promise you the essay. Read or listen to the essay. Inkley and I hope you have a good day. Good morning, bad news. Congress just approved our first $1 trillion military budget. It's more than we spent on the Vietnam War, the Korean War, the Cold War, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And by Congress, we mean a strongly bipartisan coalition of Democrats and Republicans on seemingly the only issue that they have ever agreed on, giving more money to the largest military in the world by such a huge margin that the next 11 countries on the list could pull all their military spending together and still not equal what we spend in a single year. There's no discussion on what it'll do to inflation, how we're gonna pay for it, how to reduce the burden on the taxpayer, questions of fiscal responsibility, or what the money is even gonna be used. For. We have lost every single war we've been in since World War II, with the arguable exception of the Gulf War 30 years ago. We are an unwelcome military presence globally, and our only measurable success has been subverting democratically elected governments in South America for the benefit of the global aristocracy. Every time you hear someone like Joe Manchin or Mitch McConnell talk about their concerns in raising the national debt, it's only in regards to spending money on helping Americans. But when it comes to spending money on military corporate contracts for Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and Raytheon, they're just adding it to the national debt wholesale with almost no oversight, debate, or analysis. It is an embarrassment that both parties in Congress are so devoted to spending more money to send underprivileged teenagers into deadly conflicts around the world and then refusing to help the ones that come back alive. Our bloated military is a malignancy on the United States and the world, both of which would be unfathomably better off if we spent even one-tenth of our military budget on food, housing, medicine, childcare, and education instead of lining the pockets of billion-dollar companies that are using our money to autonomously bomb innocent civilians in other countries. Why the fuck are we not watching videos about Palestine all the way through? Again, this is a genuine conversation about media literacy with what is going on. So two times it if you can't sit through the whole thing. First, it is valid if people get upset that you don't even want to sit through a 10 minute video about what's going on, seeing as how this has been going on. This oppression has been so severe for over 75 years. And the whole short attention span thing is not even real in a lot of cases because every time attention span shortens, your ability to increase encoding to memory increases. I have videos on it. There's an entire study by Microsoft in 2015 you can read on it. But if you've got a social media brain, you have the brain to be watching these videos and memorizing from it better than the average person that doesn't use their phones as much. With that out of the way, these videos would not be 10 minutes long if there was not 10 minutes worth of information in them. You do understand that the first sentence, the first five seconds of a video are not the entire thing, right? There's going to be more different, different information than what a video starts out with. If you don't watch something in full, you are quite literally missing information. Oh, well, all of it's been repeat information. It shouldn't be. Your For You page should not just be the same story over and over and over again. Sure, it's simple to understand that genocide bad, save free Palestine. Every single time you see a video online, literature, any piece of information publicly available, you need to ask yourself the following questions. What is the video about? And we're going to use my previous video for this.
my previous video is about reminding people to watch videos about Palestine all the way through. Then ask yourself, when? When is the video going to be important? When would you use that information? Are you going to get that much info out of someone drawing a squiggly, squiggly line watermelon? No. Are you going to get good info out of a news update? Like you're watching Papa's Praxis, if you're watching Miriam. Yes, you would want to watch those all the way through so you don't miss anything. You want to also ask yourself how relevant the information you're learning is. You wouldn't want to watch a historical documentary on what's going on before you watch that morning's news update, right? You want to ask yourself why this video is being made. To do that, you want to look at who posted it. As far as my previous video, I posted it. So I used an example I could access, you know, within my own account. And I posted it because I make very regular content about Palestine now. I'm seeing the same issues on my account that are plaguing other bigger, more important creators, first-hand creators. And since my account is to be an echo chamber that provides solutions for some other things the echo chamber is facing, I posted that video to remind you that one of the solutions to miscommunication is letting the other person finish speaking before you do. You also want to look at what examples creators use in the video, what literary techniques they use to get information across to you. In my previous video, I included an example of the exact type of person causing this problem. I made a video discussing the issues with how people are commenting about free Palestine and how it is getting, making our ability to get information out harder. It's flagging accounts. It is bogging down important information in comments. And I started the video by making a point that, hey, a conversation about a side geno is not the appropriate time to complain about a creator's appearance. There's a bigger issue. And I had a commenter who only listened to the first sentence of the video where I said that, paused the video, and then proceeded to insult me, thinking that I was making this about myself. Even though, had they watched another 5 or 10 seconds of a almost 10 minute video, they would have realized it's a conversation about media literacy. Instead of watching the video and taking the points I was echoing, they blocked me. Their behavior was a perfect example of what I was addressing in that video, and there wouldn't have been a communication issue if they had let me finish talking. And keep in mind, I'm using myself as an example. I have a real-world example for you. I am not the only person facing this issue. When we discuss skills of understanding among each other in the echo chamber, we are then to go apply those to the first-hand sources giving us news. Also, I'm fully aware that I look and sound really stupid, so I shouldn't be your primary source of information anyways. Next, where would I use the information? Lots of people got upset at my previous video. When I started to ask them why they were upset, a lot of the answers I got is, well, I'm protesting in person, so why do I need to watch stuff on TikTok? Well, I'm doing activism on Instagram. Why do I need to watch stuff on TikTok? If you are fully up to date on the day of the information, and you are seeing a video talking about people not being up to date because they only use TikTok, does that where match yours? No. Why would a video complaining about TikToker behavior be aimed at Instagram users or in-person protesters or people that work on documents and infographics? If this was an issue we were seeing on other platforms, it would be addressed on those other platforms. This is the only social media I have. That's why the example I used was TikTok, because it's a video about just ignoring TikTok. Applying this information in other areas is the appropriate response. That's what you're supposed to be doing. The requirement isn't use TikTok. The requirement is talk about it. Don't stay silent. Update yourself in full. How do I use the information? 
If you are only doing activism on TikTok, like me, I don't physically have the ability to go to protest and this is the only social media I have. Then from my previous video, I learn, oh, I might be missing important parts of the conversation by scrolling away from videos too fast. I can solve that by holding down the screen and letting the video speed up by putting my phone down and doing something else while I listen to it, by watching TikTok on one device and doing something else on another device, by saving it to go back and finish later, by reposting it in a time crunch or anytime. But DuckDuckGo or search engine that's not Google-ing the information I just heard about. None of the solutions involve ignoring parts of a creator's video. If you still think 10 minutes is too long, go into your phone settings and see how long on average you watch TikTok for. It's going to be over 10 minutes. Finally, who is the video for? Because every single piece of public media has an intended audience. If it didn't, public libraries where anyone could go up and pick a book up on a topic would not exist. News and television channels where any random person who may not like the content could still click on and watch the video would not exist. While every creator always aims for more people than the intended audience to see something for exposure or for those who are making money off of it, there is still a specific person that is going to benefit from the information we're sharing, hence us creating the content in the first place. But because that person is a stranger and there might be hundreds of thousands of those strangers who would benefit from the information, we just have to post it publicly and hope it finds them. I did the who, what, when, where, why out of order because starting with who, it does not behoove you. It's a lot easier to figure out the intended audience of content after you look at all the other information in the content. I had no intention to sound aggressive in this video either. That is just how I speak when I'm trying to teach things. The other complaint I've heard most is, oh, well, I don't want people to be making money off of this. And honestly, if your mindset is people unrelated shouldn't be profiting off of things like side genos, please go and boycott and protest in the buildings of any news organization whatsoever because that's exactly what they're doing. And honestly, NBC, Fox, all that uh, needs a boycott. It's been in my bio for a few months now. I'm not the dime pin in all this, though. If you're not watching things in full because it is making you shut down, melt down, trigger you, Incremental exposure that does not desensitize you is the best way to get your mind used to it. As well as let yourself cry, let yourself be mad, let yourself laugh, feel the emotions that you have to feel during this. This is horrible. This is not easy to process. But please understand, ignoring 90% of first-hand creators' videos is not doing anyone any benefit whatsoever. everyone to your first day of school. First, let's take a roll. Kelly? Here. Billy? Here. Sam, uh, Sammy, Samed, uh, um. Samida. Samida. Okay, to begin, let's discuss what makes us all unique and celebrate our diversity. Everyone come up and place a mark on where your family came from. My family came from Ireland. Who's next? Jennifer, great. United Kingdom, fantastic. 
Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, who would like to go next? Okay, great. Lily, come on up. Your family's from Germany, great. Thank you. Okay, Samida, your turn. Palestine on the map. I'll mark Israel for you. Baba, where am I from? Baba, tali shway. You're from Palestine. They call Yaffa the bride of the thief. I want to go to Palestine. Inshallah, Baba, we will return. Okay, everyone, welcome back to class. Let's continue with yesterday's activity. Yes, Samida? My name is Samida, and I am from Palestine. 